In essence, we've watched Saudi Arabia now be protected by two of the three largest nuclear arsenals on the planet. We've watched them join the BRICS New Development Bank and tell everyone in Davos that they are open to taking other currencies for oil. I have connected the dots for over three years saying this will happen. And it freaks me out how fast it is happening, but nothing like what I saw yesterday. And I will read the headline. UAE, the United Arab Emirates, officially stops using dollars for oil trades. Well, they just joined the BRICS too, by the way. They were formally admitted into the BRICS in August. The United Arab Emirates is eyeing potential oil and gas deals with up to 15 countries, including China, Russia, Egypt, all of whom are BRICS members and advocates of the continued de-dollarization. When you talk about a shot across the bow, this is as big as it gets. Now, the only thing that would be bigger than that is when this is followed up by Saudi Arabia and the remaining OPEC countries who say, yeah, look, you guys are going green. Thanks for the memories. We're going a different direction. When you put yeah. all of these groups together, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, um, and by the way, the president of Belarus has just called a formal meeting that the Eurasian uh, Economic Union and uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, should join BRICS. I've been saying they're going to do that for three years. They're all the same countries. But now there's a formal meeting in the works for that to happen. But when you put them all together with the Belt Road, which in and of itself is 75% of human population, you're talking the majority of human population. You're talking almost 80% of all the global oil supply, 70 plus percent of all the global natural gas supply, the majority of all the rare earth metals, the majority of all the precious metals. And it's a situation that is not ending. I'll take a few more pieces on this and we'll, we'll talk silver. China and Saudi Arabia just signed a, a very large, uh, about an $8 billion swap agreement. A swap agreement basically says, well, we'll trade with each other in each other's currencies rather than what everyone has always done. And that is to first go into dollars, the high interest rates of the dollar, the cost of converting and being in the SWIFT system, which we have seen already two of the BRICS members, Iran and Russia, be kicked out of SWIFT, have their assets frozen. These countries are doing it amongst one another at a better rate. You don't have to convert to dollars and um, in, a, in, a, in, in a way that is very advan um, uh, advantageous for these countries. And at the same time, they sidestep the SWIFT system. So when you see China and Saudi Arabia striking deals like this, it is just more and more of what I call logarithmic decay. Little by little yeah. by little by little by little by little and bang, all at once. It's like taking an ax yeah. and chopping a big oak tree. The first 50 chops don't do crap. You don't even see a dent yeah. in the tree. Maybe it takes 5,000 chops before it falls, but eventually the all at once happens. A couple of other things to mention, uh, Russia, just um, uh, more or less has inked a deal with Turkey. Turkey was told by the European Union that no, we don't want you in it. They, they applied again and they eh, don't expect to come into the European Union anytime soon. So Turkey more or less said, uh, well, screw you, we're gonna join the BRICS. They're also the third largest accumulator of gold this year in 2023. Uh, there's no coincidence there, but um, the deal that they're forging with Russia uh, is establishing a plan uh, for natural gas trade. And they want, Russia wants Turkey to be the hub for all of Europe for natural gas. So this is all being done in local currencies again. So sidestepping the dollar, sidestepping the SWIFT system. Another big deal. You can see the, the alliances that are being made. Venezuela in and of themselves, not too much to worry about, right? They do hold 17.5% of the known oil reserves globally. They have formally applied as a full-fledged member to BRICS, as has Pakistan, has fully applied to be a member of BRICS, as has Nigeria. Nigeria is an OPEC country. They're on the Belt Road. If Nigeria joins along with all the countries that are already there, you are at 80% of the global oil supply and 73% of the natural gas reserves globally. This is nothing to um, shake a stick at. So I just want people to know that this narrative that I talk about of continued de-dollarization will massively impact uh, all commodities. And as Zoltan Pozar says, we have entered a period of time that is no longer going to be dominated by opaque debt instruments, but rather by transparency and commodities. 
And you can see these countries not only are doing this by massively accumulating all the world's commodities, not just gold and silver, but copper and rare earth metals and wheat and soybeans and you name it. If it's a commodity, they're buying it. But at the same time, they're doing so outside the dollar. You look at a massive deal between China and Brazil. Brazil is the second largest exporter of corn in the world. They're now selling it to China for yuan. They're also doing that with soybeans. And for the United States soybean farmers, their sales are down about 60% this year because China is a big buyer of soybeans. They're now buying them from Brazil in local currencies. So keep in mind, there will be a gold-backed common settlement currency that the BRICS come out with probably next year in August. That's what we were told that they were going to go back to the drawing board after the last August meeting and the finance ministers were tasked with coming back with a plan to issue a common settlement currency that will be pegged to commodities, most likely gold. But in the meantime, they promised to trade with one another in local currencies, and that is exactly what you see happening. So this is nothing to shake a stick at. When you see the United Arab Emirates say, by the way, we're done taking dollars, it's massive. And it's even bigger when you realize that either later this week or early next week, they're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 or 70 countries coming to the United Arab Emirates to Dubai for this big um, environmental conference. I think it's interesting to know <laughs> that the time that they're having half of the world come there for this meeting, they announce we're no longer taking dollars for oil. Little by little by little, chop, 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 chop. <laughs> When's the Don't know. But you can tell by something like this, we're getting much closer. So now let's talk uh, metals and whatever else you got on your mind, brother. Man, a lot of that has to do with metals. And, you know, all of those countries, why would they want to go green? Why would they want that? And that's the scary part is we're like, we're poking the bear. Our dollar's worthless. Why in the world wouldn't they do this? And why wouldn't they buy up all the silver for us? Realistically, not be able to go green i mean that's also a thing and oh, look at look it, at look at india they just bought another 60 million ounces yeah now. and that was yeah, after buying 300 win -win. million ounces last it's year a, it's a win-win uh but also what do you silver right now is doing something interesting um it has gone up substantially over the last week week and a half what do you think it's going to do next you know um most of us, yourself included, who have been watching this for a long time, are waiting for the shoe to drop. It's like getting a dog at the pound who is abused. My parents have one, actually. And even though this dog has seen me 5,000 times, every time I go to pet it, it's, it, yeah. it's waiting to get hit. Um, there's a special place in hell for anyone that would hit a dog, by the way. But... Uh, I think we're all waiting for the shoe to drop. The thing of it is, is that the world's exchanges are being bled dry. If you look at the Silver Institute, their latest calculations oh, man. Uh, are, are all screwing. Mm -hmm. They're all being um, reevaluated and they're changing yeah. the numbers. Uh, yeah. because I made a the, video about that. Yeah, the silver <coughs> photalic, I think it's called. I don't even pronounce it right, but it's what's used in solar panels. They revised up tremendously. Mick Weir did an interesting article or video on it where showing that the numbers were way off because yeah. he took the numbers directly from the solar panel industry show that they're way yeah. off. But I do want to say one other thing. You know, they're saying that we have a, um, a another massive shortfall this year, right? A, yeah. a, a deficit again this year of- uh, Could be what? record breaking. Right, I don't know how many, a couple 200 plus million ounces shortfall. Yeah. But, you know, you and I have both talked about the pickaxe article, and I can't um, I can't vouch for its um, accuracy. I would suspect it is a lot of it. it it's all been um, his he cites facts and I was blown away by it. And um, it, the most interesting thing to me about the Silver Institute is that they ignore any military component of silver they don't have it in there and yeah and i've often said long before i read john little's article and i think he's a hell of a researcher and the article was compelling again i am not a fact checker in this respect but the article was compelling and and he cited um 
um, facts to support his thesis. But the, his whole thesis is that it's been the military industrial complex that has held down the price of silver in order to create uh, munitions and weapons and submarines and aerospace stuff and airplanes and all of this stuff that takes silver and, and the funding of the wars on both sides that we're constantly seeing for years and years and years, we need silver. And his whole thesis is that it's the military industrial complex that is, is behind the suppression of silver. Okay, let's put that aside. True or not. I'm not legitimizing it other than right, saying just look at the, the article. Look but at here's the, the thing. If you Google how much silver is in a Tomahawk cruise missile. 500 ounces. 500 ounces, right. So why is the Silver Institute ignoring the military component? And yeah. even with that, they cite that it's the biggest industrial demand ever for silver, ever in history. And yet they don't talk about the military side of it. I find it to be... Um, not very credible, I guess. And if you watch Bix's video, he goes back. In fact, I was on with him last night talking about not only did they revise last year's numbers, they've gone back and revised the last five or six years numbers. So it's kind of like the information we get out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, a bunch of bullshit, where they give us numbers and then revise it months later when everyone is not paying attention anymore. But the market reacts to the information that comes out. Immediately. And then yes. And the same thing here is here. But I do want to say that I think the world realizes how important silver is. I'm sorry for that noise. I think the world realizes how important silver is. And a lot of the countries, like India, importing 60 million ounces in October, like China, importing another 10 million ounces in October, like Turkey, importing 26 million ounces year to date, and like mysteriously last Friday, almost 4 million ounces delivered off the ETFs around the globe. Where is it all going? Who's taking it? I think we're gonna wake up one morning to see silver gap up way higher because it was one thing to suppress gold and silver when no one wanted it and everyone was happy with dollars and dollar-based assets. That's not the case anymore. And you have half of the world standing for delivery. So what you have been doing, setting the table, telling people to buy silver all of these years, I got it. be life-changing. Bigger, um, I see it. Okay, I got it. Okay. Phillips Baker, he uh, CEO of Heckler Mining, chairman of the Silver Institute, Metal's most prominent industry, recently made a presentation at the LBMA um, in Spain. And he says it's, it's silver's role in the transition to green. In a press release, he says, uh, someone asks him whether we have enough silver to go green. Like He replied in the affirmative, explaining... While the market is in currently in structural deficit, above ground stocks will be mobilized to meet the demand. Then he goes in, the rest of the article talks about how it is not possible. Demand outstrips supply in 2022 by nearly 238 million ounces, possibly the most significant deficit on record. Um, and then he goes into uh, the uh, how the output fell versus the previous year, confirming what Heckler Mining said about difficulty, difficulties miners face in bringing new production online. It's getting harder to find high-grade deposits, more difficult and expensive to develop and operate a mine. And then it just keeps going on and on. So why in the world would he say that we do when everything just contradicts that statement? And I was and and I was I was reading this like it doesn't make sense. He says it's one little line, but the rest of his of what he's talking about just contradicts himself. So uh I don't know. I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, it is. And when we're going into our third year of structural de deficits in supply versus demand, this becomes a problem. And silver is found in nature in a form called epithermal, very near the surface, meaning the big deposits were found decades ago. So yeah. it's not like you're going to all of a sudden stumble across more silver, especially when the price has been held down for so long that it has really mothballed most exploration uh, companies it's too expensive and not lucrative enough for these companies to explore so it has really put a curtail i guess you could say on on future silver deposits where only 35 percent of all the silver found came from companies that are looking for it the rest is byproduct yep. so it's one of these deals where i think people have a hard time believing that we could actually be misdirected by authorities that we could be misdirected to be thrown off the scent off the trail